Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Just a real quick check. All right, so my name is Erica Williams. I am, it is my honor to serve as your Ms. Austin president. And um, welcome to our Lunch and Learn September series. Today, uh, I wanted to just mention a couple of things. We've talked about uh, a couple of times about when we're going to come to a hybrid type of event. And at, at this time, we're gonna continue at least taking it month by month. And uh, next month, we will continue to be virtual. We are looking at planning a, a top golf event. We did that a couple of years ago and it was a great success. It's something that can be done outdoors. And again, we are, are monitoring that, but hope to pull that together this year. So without ado, um, today's topic is our HIT security panel, uh, meaningful HIT security while under duress, otherwise known as carrying an umbrella while the sky is falling is our topic today. And today we welcome X-Force Red. X-Force Red is IBM's security team of hackers. Uh, companies hire this team to uncover and help fix security weaknesses that criminal attacker, attackers may use for personal gain. The team's core services include penetrating testing, penetration testing, vulnerability management, and adversary simulation services. Today's panelists are Wayman Cummings. Wayman is the VP of Security Operations at Unisys Corporation. Charles Henderson is the Global Managing Partner for X-Force. His team includes X-Force Red, X-Force IR, which is IBM's security defensive team of incident responders, investigators, and researchers. Jeremy Kelly. Uh, Jeremy is the CTO of Exodus. Exodus Intelligence does world-class vulnerability research so you can detect the undetectable. And our moderator today is Abby Ross. Abby is an associate partner for X-Force Red. She leads marketing for the team and will be our moderator for our panel. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for sharing your insights with us today. So Abby, I'll let you take it from here. You're muted, we can't hear you. How's that? Is that better? Yes. Sorry. Great way to start a presentation on mute. Sorry about that, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you can see the slides that I popped up. Um, please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A box on your screens. Um, we will be taking questions live during the event. So we hope that um, you will ask questions throughout the entire thing. So let's get started. The first topic the panel will discuss today is protecting critical data during a health crisis. And again, we have some questions here, but feel free to ask your questions live as well. So during a health crisis, when resources are short and focused on other priorities, which security weaknesses can arise? Charles, let's start with you. So, uh, you know, one of the things about criminals, uh, nation state actors and uh, others, uh, they have a knack for finding people at their weakest point. Um, and, you know, that's, that's really important for uh, healthcare and for uh, um, others to understand during the pandemic when you have uh, industries, not just healthcare, um, that are stretched incredibly thin. Uh, attackers are able to exploit this weakness, and uh, especially in the case of, say, ransomware or um, things that deal with the critical nature of what's going on, um, they are able to leverage already stretched organizations and, and take them really to the breaking point. Uh, and, and, you know, a great example of this outside of healthcare is actually the supply chain problems that we saw um, first caused by the pandemic and then exploited by attackers. What attackers did was they watched world events and saw how they were impacting the supply chain and, and, and turned around and said, we can do that for profit. I think you're you're seeing right now attackers use the same strategies uh, to go after an already stretched uh, U.S. health system uh, and, and try and exploit it for profit as well. 
women? No, I would just I would just echo what Charles talked about. And it's like any situation where you're already you're hyper focused on the healthcare component of it, it makes it an enticing target for those who want to create mayhem. They look at it when we look at ransomware, which is kind of one of those key things, it's become a business. It's got a business model no different than Unisys has. It has healthcare. It has paid time off. They built a business model out of this. And so the most successful way is to target those who are in the most, which is why the healthcare industry became such a big target through our pandemic and still is. It's why the the supply chain is now under attack. So I, I pretty much agree with that. And I think that any crisis, we could substitute health for any type of crisis that we're going through. There's always that exploitability component that we're seeing. Thank you, Jeremy, Raymond. anything Charles. else to add? Yep, Jeremy, oh, anything? Sorry. Oh, you guys are fighting for me. This is great. <laughs> uh, you guys hit the nail on the head, right? Like uh, criminals are, they're brilliant. They're not idiots for the most part. It's a, the difference between them and, and us is that we have morals and scruples and they don't, but they use the same skills to attack weaknesses, right? And, and I would add during this health crisis and, and during these things, fatigue is a huge weakness. Uh, whether it's compliance fatigue or alert fatigue or patching fatigue or even uptime fatigue, I can't afford to take this down and, and do the updates. That leads to a, a lot of just chinks in the armor, I guess is the way to put it. And criminals are, they're brilliant. They're lazy and they will attack the weakest point that they can find. And, and fatigue leads us to overlook things. And let's be honest, we can't fix it all. We can never patch it all. As soon as it's patched, either the patch is broken and there's a, a one day workaround for it, or there's another vulnerability waiting in the wings. And so since we can't do it all, that fatigue also begins to set in as well. And so I think that's where a lot of the weaknesses come in. And that's, I hear from a lot of organizations that are struggling with, they just can't do it all. How do they prioritize what they focus on? So that leads into our next question. What are the typical kinds of attacks and attackers that are trying to find and exploit those weaknesses? Uh, Jeremy, why don't we start with you since we left off with you? Yeah. Um, so I, I will look I, for a living. We find vulnerabilities in software. Humans are always way weaker than any software I can find. I, I can literally email a zip file and say, please open this. Here's the password to open it to get it past the filters and they get infected. Now, having said that, we still see overwhelmingly vulnerabilities play a huge role in this in limiting controls that have been put on top of compliance and people issues. And so to, to your question, we see a lot of attacks that are either, uh, they're a hybrid of social engineering and then a type of lateral movement across an entire network space, or we'll just see an outright, um, <laughs> you know, ransomware, for instance, if somebody can get in, they'll block, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll overcome all mitigations by moving across multiple surfaces, whether it's the human surface or the, the digital firewall or whatnot. Charles, I know you can add to that. Or not. Sorry, I had some trouble coming off mute. So, humans, you know, uh, I think we've seen a, and Wayman alluded to it earlier, we've seen a broadening of the definition of an attacker. Um, and I don't mean that from the attack sense it's changed. I mean, um, it's become big business. Uh, there's pretty staunch recruiting and training programs. Um, and ransomware has largely, I think, lowered the barrier to entry into cybercrime. That is to say, you can be a successful cyber criminal much earlier in your cyber criminal career than you, you previously needed to be. Uh, if you can figure out how to use ransomware kits that are sold on tour, if you can um, figure out how to use cryptocurrency <laughs> to collect your money, 
And um, if you've got a little bit of ingenuity, if you've got those three things, you, you, you can have a budding career in cybercrime. And what, what that means is that, you know, it's sort of like the, the dot-com revolution where anybody could start a company suddenly, um, where your, your ability to start a, a really global presence was as close as the internet. But now you see it in, in, in sort of cybercrime where, you know, the, these kids have made it really simple. You no longer need to worry about stolen, uh, selling ill-gotten goods, where, whereas, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you had a, a breach that exposed credit card data or social security data, you had to go on to Tor or somewhere and sell that data. You had to enter the, the marketplace. You had to build a reputation um, in order to monetize your ill-gotten gains. Now, there, there, there's a more direct connection to monetization which means you get a much faster revenue turnaround. There's much more incentive and um, there's, there's, there's stronger edu education and enablement. Um, I, I, you know, I, and I don't see the cybercrime uh, economy collapsing anytime soon. I think that there is more than enough target area out there to support the current criminals and more. And, and, and when you think about that, I think that um, the attacks and attackers are going to be constantly evolving to sort of the lowest common denominator. And I, I think the real problem there also is the, the level of unpredictability that occurs when you increase that attack pool um, so dramatically. Thank you. We had a live question come in and Jeremy, you addressed this slightly in your answer. What about the state of mind of a user, like being occupied and giving away information such as in phishing attacks? Anything to add to that, Jeremy? Yeah, overwhelmingly, I would, I would say complexity is the enemy of security, right? And, and so when we expect our users to be security experts and know OPSEC front and back from the very beginning, while they're trying to do their job, we can't expect them to, to be experts in that. We're, we're hiring surgeons, we're hiring administrators, we're hiring mechanics. We're not, we're, they're not, I don't have surgeons, administrators and mechanics working within the security organization, right? I, I, the security organization exists to make their job easier and facilitate them sharing data with the right people and not sharing data with the wrong people. So OPSEC is always a training mechanism. It's always a training requirement, but at the same time, we have to expect they're gonna get it wrong. And so we have to have simple systems in place to provide them checks and balances on what should they share, who should they share with, are they sharing with the right people? Are they sharing with true I, people that they believe they're communicating with? Uh, do you have good identity mechanisms in place for your organization so that you can prove when they get an email from the CEO saying, I need this report, that immediately looks, there's something fishy about it that looks immediately wrong. Because I cannot, again, I cannot expect these people who are overworked and overtaxed as it is to think the same way that a security professional would about information. Just to extend upon that, um... I think very often we put our users in a position to fail. Yep. Oh, uh, you know, everyone talks about positive training for phishing and all these things. It's the negative reinforcement. It's the negative training rather. And I don't mean like catching people falling for phishing attempts and highlighting. What I mean is organizations send out links all the time or attachments all the time. We teach our users to engage in bad behavior. And then we're surprised when they fall for phishing attempts that look exactly like that training that we install upon them. And it's unintentional training. We, we're not setting out to train our users to click on uh, links. We're not setting out to teach them to open attachments, but we're doing it by sending those types of things out. And even security organizations do it, okay? And, and fundamentally, until we become the adults in the room, we can't expect to be surprised when everyone slips up and behaves exactly the way we've trained them to behave over the years. 
Um, and, and, and fundamentally, there, there's other situations where we, we put people in position to fail. We, we have systems that give way too much access to people that don't need it. Um, access control is something we all talk about, but we don't practically implement well. I think there's a lot of things that organization, taking aside all the, the security policies, taking aside all the security measures, the net, shiny tools that you're deploying on your network, uh, all these things, there's, there's just simple sort of practices that we, we've let go away thinking that our security budget will save us. Thank you. Next question. What are attackers' motives? What may they do with the findings from a compromise? Wayman, we haven't heard from you in a while. Let's start with you on this one. Yeah, I think we did warn you that the three of us together could be a little challenging. So, and this is, you know, this kind of plays into what's been touched on already is, you know, the, the core motivator is financial. And, and that has been the consensus of the intelligence organizations. In fact, I had a conversation last week with some of our partners in the bureau and it specifically is that. Then you've got a smaller component, which is focused on either impacting the competition or from a nation state level. I hate Russia, I hate the US, I wanna impact them. So it becomes, the motive becomes simply, how can I financially benefit from what I've been, and kind of to the second part of it. You know, what may they do with this finding? They literally may take that finding and sell. And I'll give you a great quick story. We had a situation in the past where we found access and identities to our company for sell. And what this person has done is they really didn't care about compromising our company. Their goal was to compromise the companies that we work with. And same, and you know, kind of translating this healthcare system, I may not really care necessarily about the hospital system, but I want to impact its patients, all of the people that are connected to all those devices. So at that point, you know, it becomes, all right, I'm going to sell this access in order for you to gain access to all of these other entities. You know, when we go back to the, the ransomware equation, which, you know, I know it's going to be overused, but it's going to be a repetitive thing we talk about because it's so central to what the motive are. It goes back to that financial motivation. And if I can hijack all of your medical devices and hold you for ransom, what are you going to be willing to pay? Jeremy, do you have anything to add to that? I have to unmute first. Yeah. Um, Wayman hit it, right? Profit is the primary motivator. But at the same time, we deal with a lot of federal customers. Uh, I deal with a lot of federal agencies. I deal with friendly governments. And when you start looking at nation state actors, they're less interested in, in getting Bitcoin out of you. Um, I mean, maybe some of the smaller ones, I don't know. But for the most part, the larger actors are not trying to get you to send Bitcoin from a, an attacker motive. But what we're seeing is they're interested in the long game. Um, maybe ransomware, but a lot of times it's data exfiltration so they can blackmail leadership. I've actually seen parties doing this. And so from a medical standpoint, how valuable would that data be to have medical history on world leaders? And what could you do with that information at uh, election time or just at any time? And so I'll, I'll go back to, depends on the attacker. It depends on the actor. Um, we saw a group out of, uh, I'll just say Asia, that was actually targeting executives and their laptops in hotels, conference rooms, and meetings overseas just to plant for the long game. If someone wasn't an executive, they literally would compromise the machine and then clean up after themselves and leave. They only wanted the highest level of hardware. And, and there's, that's a wealth of data that one is profitable, but two, those executives will also see items that again, at a at a federal level have global consequences. So you have to ask yourself, who am I being targeted by? What is the benefit to them? Sometimes it's profitable, sometimes it's financial. Those will crop up, they're playing a shorter game, they're playing checkers. 
the nation state who are playing the long game, attempting to manipulate things or playing chess? You know, it's, it's important to note, though, that even the ransomware operators uh, are moving towards data exfiltration as well yep. before they lock everything down. Uh, so there is there are two factors at play there. One, the data has value, particularly to the nation states, and you can come through it offline, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, but two, um, what we're seeing is I think a more versatile attack group that's realized there is a long and a short game. The two don't have to be mutually exclusive. That's right. Um, for, for the longest time, we approached it as two different attack groups. And you're starting to see a blurring of those lines where, look, you can do both. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that should frighten a lot of folks because I tell you what, if, if you can keep the lights on with your short game, and play the long game as your lottery ticket, that's where uh, you have even more incentive to commit crime. I've, I've had another yeah. idea so I want to wanna... add on to this. Oh, go okay, ahead, Wayman, go ahead. I'll wait. No, I actually wanted, to, I saw that there was a question that come in that kind of ties into to the strategy of defense around this. And it's from Julian. It's like, why not have a surgeon, nurse, and administrator on the security team? And actually, what it needs to become is the overall strategy of how we, how we train each other. So understanding security teams need to understand the model that the surgeon has, his priorities, what systems he has to have that are critical. But then we also need the surgeon to understand what are the risks that are being created by that system, how we can work collectively to kind of mitigate that. So it's a bringing the teams together versus just adding one to another team. And sorry, yeah. go ahead, Charles, or Jeremy, whatever you wanted to add. Well, I was going to add to the attacker motive question again really quickly. There's another one that we can't forget, right? And this is the supply chain attack. Um, I have spoken with executives at very large providers, and let's talk healthcare for a second. Every large provider that is selling medical equipment does not want to be the avenue of attack on a, on a walled garden network. They do not want their device to be the one that goes in to a segregated network, plugged in, and then provides the ability to move around and exfil. And so, again, I'm going to go back to you must, you must take into account the motive of the attacker and what is the worst that they can do. You may get lucky and they just ransomware you and ask for Bitcoin. Or, you, or to Charles' point, they may do a lot of insidious things and then try and cover it up by being loud with a very botched ransomware, which we've also seen. And so- You, you may even fund their advanced activities by paying the ransom- uh, That's exactly right. On, on, on the front end. Um, I, I, and I, I, I'm not- Which goes being, back to the recruiting- I, I'm not trying to just right? be uh, funny there. The, the scariest part is uh, you, you've seen people wake up to the multifaceted outcomes of a breach and say, we can be all things to all people rather than specialists in ransomware or supply chain or what have you. And if you're dealing with the right size health organization, you, you can do a lot of damage. Yeah. We have, will... some, we have some other questions that came in that I want to get to. Um, Wayman, I'm going to start with you on this one. Can you comment on the security pros and cons for using single sign-on solutions? It's a pro. It's, you know, anything when you look at single sign on and an authority in that case, and they couple that with MFA, it removes some of the lower class attackers. It makes it a bit easier. It does not remove the risk, but it gives you more of a single identity source. So it is, to me, at, at my company, I've instituted a policy that everything is going to go through a single sign on. And and everything is going to be MFA. And it's a little bit, you know, we're trying to minimize the impact the user experience, but at the same time, I can't make it as easy. I can't make it easy for the attackers to compromise our company. So. As an attacker and someone who does security research, I really yeah. appreciate one big shiny target that gets me into something else just to be. Yeah, I, I get it. I get it, but it's also, from a defender standpoint, it's one centralized focus. That's right. That we can log, monitor, and look for the behavioral analytics. So, 
Yeah. Stay away from stuff, Jeremy. Hey, can I? Never mind. <laughs> Uh, we have another one, which is an interesting one about another stakeholder that we haven't talked about yet. The product managers of healthcare systems, are they being given information by SecOps that we've learned that they or the architect should be passing on to the programmers? Uh, I'll just, I'll chime in here. So that's something that we've instituted. We've seen from the traditional product management and security operations, the two have always been two separate things. The product side is like, we're building the next greatest thing. The security side is like, we're the cool guys who know everything that's happening and we don't, we don't care. So we're seeing more of, of a shift to where it's like, hey, from the security side, you know, I can take a service like from, from Charles, from Jeremy, and I can learn about the deficiencies we may have or the risks we may have. And I'm working in conjunction with those product teams. And that's actually one of the, the things that we started our journey with X Force Red was around, okay, you know what? We're gonna take a hard look at our products. Let's start looking for these problems and work in a collective way. So that from, from my perspective, that's how we kind of solve that. And what's what we're doing to kind of move beyond that part of chat type of challenge. Can I put a plug here though? Let me just, I, I, in a previous life, I was a director of threat engineering for Carbon Black. And I, I ran a pretty large part of the engineering organization from the threat standpoint. Uh, product managers are much more interested from a product standpoint in, in, in increasing their feature offering because often they are judged actually by new sales, not by retention. So to, the, to you here, this is your plug until you make security a top tier first class requirement on that product offering, it will be second. It will be, um, it'll be reduced in priority. Now, security products are a lot of times the security product itself, the security of the product is taken into account, but I have had conversation in instances where products that were not within the security space the security of that product was greatly minimized because it did not offer more features for the buyers. So you get to vote with your dollars and they'll respond positively. I promise not to talk as much on the next question. This no, is can, fascinating you talk, stuff. You can talk all you want. It is a, it is a panel for a reason. <laughs> um, so next question. With staff so focused on other priorities, what should organizations do to instill security best practices in employees day to day without overwhelming them? Jeremy, you want to start? Yeah, uh, yeah. since I promised I wouldn't talk as much. Uh, look, again, complexity is the enemy. Uh, I'll go back to what I said earlier, right? Our, our people are good at their jobs. They are not good at our jobs. And so to the point of having... Um, you know, medical staff on the security operations team as the voice of the user, the voice of the customer, 100% for that. Tailor the security offering you have to your business delivery, not to the security best practices that may not 100% apply within what you're trying to deliver. Wayman, I'm sure you have opinions on this. No, and I, I think you're right. And we talked on it a little bit before. It's about creating a cooperative. You know, when we have the siloed approach that has never been successful, we need, we need to be able to have a collective view where the user experience is not being impacted as severely as a security guys would like. I had a question asked to me when I first started or shortly after starting at Unisys. Our CEO said, how are you going to secure this company? And I go, I will secure it in bankruptcy. And that's the reality as a security guy, as an Intel guy. I, I know all the things to make this company perfectly secure, and it'll never function again. So it's finding a way to work together. They need to start, to Jeremy's point, the security teams need, need to sit down with your surgical teams. They need to sit down with your patient care teams. You need to understand what devices are connecting to the network. If these devices actually need to connect outside of the network, you know, telehealth created a whole new challenge for the healthcare industry because it was how can we quickly get to see patients who aren't in this COVID status because that's our hyper focus right now. How can we still see them? So we created telemedicine. You know, and so it creates other avenues. 
for us, we sent everybody home. We said work from home. That created the single hugest risk to every organization that exists because our threat landscape shifted from just our corporate, our corporate networks to all of the devices connected in my house. I'm sitting in a room that has all kinds of connected devices because I have kids and I've isolated them from the network that's talking to you right now. Those are things I know how to do because I've spent my time there. I wouldn't expect a surgeon to know how to do that, but I certainly, I don't know how to operate on people, even though I have played the game operation. So I think I, I got a little bit of surgical skills and I'll pause there. Hey, I want to come back. Uh, I want to come back around to that single sign-on question really quickly because that's a great example. Look, I actually I joke and uh, about it, but that's a great example of a security tool that you can use. You can adopt single sign-on. Your users now learn how to sign on to every application with one unified. Um, interface. They don't have to learn 15 different ways to authenticate and prove that they are valid and uh, a trusted user to get into a system and get them wrong, right? Now, when I joke and say it does give me one centralized place to attack, that's true. But at the same time, it gives you one centralized place to monitor, to log, to harden, and defend. If, uh, if you've got 15 applications with 15 different ways to authenticate law and and validate your users. One, you're adding burden to your users to prove that they're trusty. And two, you now have 15 different ways that I, as an attacker, can try and get into a toehold to any one of those 15 applications. So there are benefits to single sign-on. I'm not, I want to make sure people didn't realize I was saying don't do it because I, I actually am for it. But I will, as an attacker, I'm going to go there first. So make sure that you've hardened and you have good monitoring on it. So that's a good bridge into the next question. So outside of single sign-on, what are the main security controls and services organizations should adopt to better protect their data during a crisis? Charles, let's start with you on this one. Well, you know, uh, you see through the executive order and NIST and everybody else, sort of a shift, you know, th th that flies sort of in the face of, uh, the, the, the single sign on simplicity message, which is uh, implementation of zero trust. Um, I think that increasingly you're seeing organizations pressured to, to look towards zero trust, especially as we, uh, we decentralize the environment. And th this is less on point for healthcare organizations, frankly, because healthcare care organizations, you have a, you know, well, you do have telemedicine and things like that. You, you also have a centralized facility. You don't have um, uh, as big a pressure on decentralization, but there still is pressure. You still have um, remote work, even in medicine. And, um, the, the simple, the, the old adage used to be encrypt data at rest and, you know, that was going to be make everything fine. Um, now, when you talk about um, security controls, you're talking about everything from um, ensuring that your supply chain is intact. You're talking about um, data redundancy so that if you face a ransomware um, uh, situation, that you have some fallback plan. Um, you're talking about so many things that I think the real answer for security controls is starting to map them out with adversary simulation and things like that um, to really understand what security controls are important for your organization. I don't think we are at a state of simplicity any longer where we can say, if your organization adopts these three strategies, you're gonna be okay. Because, and, and we'd love to give advice that's that simple, but it turns out that organizations have become such complex ecosystems. Um, and, and in a way this goes to what Jeremy was just saying about, you know, hey, I, I, you know, I like the simplicity of single sign-on, everything in one location. As we move away from that, 
so too do we move away for, from, you know, good sage advice of three things that will make you better. And, and that's why, in addition to adversary simulation, I also recommend tabletop exercises and um, other organizational activities that help to expose your weaknesses. And keep in mind, you don't, um, you don't necessarily have to um, do these with an outside vendor. You can do a lot of these things internally and you should be doing it organizationally. I do recommend involving an outside vendor occasionally, um, but you know, tabletop exercises have a lot of value. And when we respond to an incident, I can tell you there's a night and day difference in terms of preparation between organizations that have undergone extensive tabletopping and those that have not. Charles, Jeremy? well, before we toss it to Jeremy, there is a specific follow-up for you, Charles, in, in the question box. Um, if you had to, and I know you said it, it's gotten too complex to pick three, but for a hospital specifically, are there any basic controls or processes that hospitals should have in place? Look, you know, what, if we weren't talking about hospitals, one of the first things uh, um, I would say is, you know, a hardened uh, 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 interior with a zero trust strategy. The fact is that hospital patient care uh, 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 life comes first. So a lot of times some of these recommendations are less practical. That said, strong uh, behavior analysis uh, implementations and identity and strong identity and access management, um, as well as strong testing and tabletop, you know, what I just talked about. I think the, in those three initiatives, if a hospital adopts aggressively, can move the needle farther than any other thing. Um, I, I, I've seen healthcare providers that have been very successful with those three things. I'd be interested to get Jeremy's take as well, as well as the original question uh, <laughs> that we sort of abandoned there. Jeremy? Yeah, um, I'll start with saying, I agree with you agreeing with me, uh, which yeah. I love, that's fantastic. <laughs> no, uh, complexity is so good for an attacker. It is so delightful to see stacks and stacks of applications that are just legacy uh, attackers love that. I've got a catalog of thousands of proof of concept exploits on end days that um, just keep coming up. It's fantastic. Complexity is delightful for the bad guys. So to answer the question about what are the main security controls, um, I'm going to dodge the question, to be honest, and here's why. I have actually seen healthcare environments that were flat. The network had no segregation. They actually had uh, like EKG machines plugged into Cat5 in the same, like on the same flat surface or the same flat network that the, the management systems were plugged into and the Wi Fi and guest Wi Fi on the same flat surface. So for them, I would argue like basis, basic segregation would actually count as a security control in an amazing way. Now, for a much more mature environment, um, I actually am a big fan of identity because a breach will occur. And if you have good identity that actually gets carried through multiple applications, you can actually begin to crawl and, and do proper kind of post-mortem and, 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 and really mature the, the network and the, the resources, right? And the, the security operations. Uh, so identity is one. And then two, um, Look, network operations, IT, and security are always, always at odds uh, because they're judged in very different ways. IT, let's think about it. They're judged by uptime, 100% uptime, and they actually get like a, you get a star. Here's a sticker. You did a good job. Have a corn dog. Thank you. Security operations would love to unplug everything. There's no breaches in a powered off device. And so those organizations typically within or those groups within a large organization are actually judged in opposing metrics. And so a lot of times, uh, believe it or not, a security control, people don't think of it this way, could actually be the way that you organize and measure the success of each of those organizations. Um, and I'm seeing multiple organizations are bringing operations and security into the same group, whereas we had them separated for a long time. 
because of the way they measure success by those orgs. I could talk a lot more, but I'll pause there. You know, I, I think it's interesting though, how bad the state of identity is in, in healthcare in general, but oh. in, 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 in the industry at large, outside of healthcare even. Um, but I think that you can make up for a bad identity program with other security technologies. It's not great, but it's doable. But the problem is those other security technologies are prohibitive in healthcare because they, they will impact time to respond for somebody walking into a patient care room. And because of that, I think that the state of identity that is a pervasive problem across companies in general, uh, industry in general, is highlighted in healthcare. And I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I think that it's interesting that, you know, you, you probably can't get security professionals to agree on much in life. We both highlighted identity as number one on that list. And I think that that should be a big takeaway from anybody listening today. Yeah. So what I, I actually want to add one thing, and I think one of the areas, and I know as we're trying to move along here, but one of the ways goes to the segmentation. So, you know, as the head of security for Unisys, I want to know your identity every time you touch a system. But if there's a group of systems that are lumped together that are isolated, then maybe getting access to that group of systems is the one time that I need to know your identity and then I'm not going to hit you every time. So I think there are some ways around that, Charles, that we can help with the healthcare system and healthcare organizations to where we're not putting such a heavy security burden. Thank you, great points. So let's transition into our second topic, the internet of medical things revolution. Give me one second so I can see the words. What are examples of IOMT technologies that healthcare organizations might not think of yet attackers may target? Charles, let's start with you on this. So it, it, you're, we've reached a point where on a reporting basis, on an updating basis, on some basis, nearly every device in a healthcare facility today exists in some level of IOMT. Um, we, we saw a couple of years back, um, patient uh, 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 medication monitors and dispersers have a major firmware issue. Um, and that firmware issue allowed um, updating with unsigned updates. That is sort of security 101 for um, so, you know, the IOT devices, you know, it's something that we covered a long time ago. The, the problem is a lot of this code is antiquated. A lot of, um, a lot of things you've seen that traditionally weren't IOMT have been retrofitted. And the degrees to which they're IOMT is interesting. And those that are not connected actually very often can pose a bigger threat. You know, we, we saw, um, a, uh, a, a surgical device that uh, that took um, uh, took instruction from USB key. So doctors were inserting USB keys into this device, um, and of course, the device manufacturer supplied specific purpose built USB keys. But but of course, as well, any USB key would work. So doctors were using their own USB keys, and. What you're quickly seeing is in that blending of technology, even the devices that are not connected full time um, have an impact. So I think that as we define IOMT, what you're, you're really looking at is any device that um, has the capability for firmware updating, it has the connectivity for reporting, has the connectivity for firmware updating, and you need to look at a broader device 
testing uh, uh, scope. And, and, you know, Jeremy, you talked about earlier device manufacturers not wanting to be the entry point into these environments. The sad fact is, though, that many of these devices are in use despite the fact that they've stopped developing code for them years ago. So these device manufacturers may be concerned about the things they're selling now. But what about the things they sold to healthcare companies five years ago? Or what about the device manufacturers who are now in a different line of business or all these things? I mean, you know, it's one thing if, you're, uh, if your thermostat in your house has a vulnerability that you can't patch. What happens when your heart pressure monitor has a vulnerability that you can't patch? The, the, the tolerances for insecurity are very different when patient life is at stake. Yeah. Hey, let, me, let me add on to that. Um, look, I'm a pretty nerdy guy. Like, there are some things that don't have to be said. And I live in the future, weirdly enough. My wife I, drives her crazy. I have every gadget here. About two months ago, I stopped at a gas station to get some gas or to get some air in one of my tires. And uh, out of habit, I walked into the store and tried to get $2 in quarters because that's what you do. And, uh, and I said, I need to use it to put air in the tires. And the guy said, oh, no, it takes Apple Pay. The air pressure, the air compressor at the gas station takes Apple Pay now, y'all. Uh, that's Internet of Things. That's not an Internet of Medical Things. Like Charles was saying, your heart pressure monitor is also online uh, because that device sends telemetry on a regular basis. Sleep apnea machines send telemetry on a regular basis. Um, cameras are everywhere in every device, and they all run Linux. We love cameras when we start hacking a device because they all run some form of embedded Linux, and we have a hundred percent success rate on any. IoT device on in within an industry, any industry. Um, so there are a lot of things that people don't think of that you that end up on your network: heart pressure, sleep apnea, etc. Uh, cameras, um, chargers for electric vehicles are running multiple levels of operating systems that are communicating within a small private network, and then they actually plug in to send data out to the provider. That's on your network now. Point of sale systems that are in the cafe at your clinic are on the same network. And if we've got 100% success rate in compromising those, and we've, all, we've also seen those shipped with malicious content. Uh, and so if you name it, if it plugs in, if it provides something useful to you, there's something complex under the hood it's an attack surface. Every room in your hospital, with the possible exception of the bathroom, has joined the IOMT. Actually, uh, we and there are smart toilets. We've tested them. Even that, the smart air fresheners that will send a text to a dashboard to say "I'm out of air freshener" are on the wireless. So, oh yeah, because that's going to get updated in a year from now when there's a vulnerability discovered, and yet it's on your network. The the the, the point is that. Look, you've got you've got organizations that are stretched thin from a staffing perspective. Yeah, they're un, under immense pressure. The pandemic has not made it any better, and a, a lot of the devices that make life easier have the potential. I don't want to scare anyone, but the potential to make life harder as well. So, you know, one of those things becomes, you know, what's been tested, what hasn't been tested. Um, what mitigating controls are in place to protect in case this device is um, attacked. Just understanding the implica implications. Look, if your air freshener gets um, uh, uh, compromised, it could be a staging point for attack elsewhere in your environment, or it could just dump out a lot of air freshener into the bathroom. One is really bad, one is annoying, uh, depending on your sense of smell. So, you know, the, understanding attack profile, under, understanding, uh, doing some simple um, threat modeling can go a long way to understanding, hey, what, what's the real world impact here?
We have a really good um, audience question along these lines. A vendor is asking to place IoT devices connecting through Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. What are the security concerns with these kinds of devices? Charles, we'll start with you. So, you know, a, a lot of it is going to depend on um, what the device has access to, what it's doing over Bluetooth. Um, is the Bluetooth simply a reporting function? Is it a one-way function? Is it taking commands via Bluetooth? Um, there's a lot of folks that will consider radio strength a security control. With a directional antenna, I, I, I can debunk that. We had, a, we had an intern build a proof of concept um, whereby um, they were able to associate with a plane's Wi-Fi while it was in flight at altitude with a directional antenna. Okay, now that Wi-Fi signal wasn't hitting the ground, but well, well, not at a usable signal strength, but that directional antenna changes things. Um, that is definitely true for a lot of these radio frequencies. So don't think of signal, signal strength as a security control. That said, how is it being used? My advice to the, to the person asking the question is, ask for testing history, ask for a commitment to security, Understand, has this been tested? If you're using it in a Michigan critical state, don't just take their word for it. Conduct your own testing. Um, you can hire a third party firm. But if you're willing to trust their testing, ask who did the testing. You know, was this, um, uh, you know, we had one of our employees take an earnest look at it and they think it's secure. Is this, we had a third party firm take a look at it and they, they found some legitimate problems. We fix them. We have a commitment to security. If they give you a security test report and then it's just, hey, everything's hunky-dory, that's a red, red flag to me. Because I, I tell you what, the first time we test any technology, it, it doesn't get a clean bill of health. You, that, that's an iterative cycle. It's a process, right? Um, and and uh, it's important to see security for what it is in that process and make sure that that process has been done. Um, if, if, if you can't get information about a testing history, you really need to look at either engaging in testing yourself or, or hiring a firm to do it, um, or maybe looking for an alternative product. And that is a segue into the next question, um, which Wayman, Charles gave his insights already, but Wayman, I'd love to hear from you on this. What questions should end user companies be asking their suppliers to gauge if security is prioritized? What are some other questions that you would ask of your suppliers if you were in a healthcare organization, Wayman? So, and, and again, I think Charles touched upon it well. It is, what is this? I, I'm gonna ask the question, we do a tiered process and it depends the connectivity of the device. So if I extrapolate this, say I'm working as the security head of security for a hospital system. I'm going to say, all right, what is this di device connecting to, to gauge how in how much I really want to know about it? You know, the, the SOX reports, the, and I know the healthcare environment has a lot of different uh, assessors. So SOX 2 type 2 reports may not mean a lot to y'all. They're great to tell me that your company knows how to pass a compliance assessment, but it doesn't tell me about the tool. So for us, if it is a high risk component, if it's the latest ventilator, then I'm going to want to have an independent assessment of how that is connected. Or if it's something I don't have the funds to pay to have that assessed, then I'm gonna put it going back my approach around the isolated network segmenting of our network so that the connectivity isn't out beyond those components and really focusing my monitoring on the connectivity between those tiers. So it, and again, it's one of those things where we have to trust some of the people we're working with, but when it comes to people's lives, uh, trust but verify. Thank you. We only have about six minutes left. So a couple more questions, then we got to wrap. But um, before we move on, the next topic, I'll just ask one question, but I want to get this one out there as well. If organizations are using IOMT devices, monitoring and scanning those devices can lead to millions, sometimes billions of incident alerts and vulnerabilities. 
How can companies decipher which alerts to investigate and which vulnerabilities to prioritize? Charles, let's uh, start with you. Look, you know, I, I don't want to send the message, don't fix everything, but definitely take a prioritized approach. We have organizations that are facing one to two million unpatched vulnerabilities that have come to us looking for advice. And those organizations have the bandwidth to spearhead 50 to 60 concurrent initiatives to patch. You don't have to be a mathematician to figure out that that's going to take a real long time. And they're going to come up, you know, the state of vulnerability research these days, they're going to have way more vulnerabilities in the pipeline than they're going to be able to address. So the question becomes, how do you prioritize this one both? We, we, um, we have a um, fairly complex approach that, that we use, but it, it, it's simplistic to use, um, um, it, or it's simplistic to digest. Um, and it basically takes input from our penetration testers, from our uh, uh, Intel gathering from uh, um, our work in vulnerability research and, and prioritizes the vulnerabilities. And, and that's really important because, you know, look, if we can rank college football teams one to 25 and, and we'll, we'll ignore what happened to UT this week. I, I know not everyone on the phone is a UT fan, but that was, <laughs> it was an unfortunate experience uh, for all of us. Um, yeah, SEC, SEC. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, if we can rank college football teams one to 25, why can't we rank vulnerabilities? Well, the answer is we can. <laughs> and we do. Um, and, and that's key. So it becomes, can you adopt a structured approach whereby the message isn't, I'm not going to tackle all the vulnerabilities, but I'm going to tackle them in this order. And these are, this is the number one thing we should be worried about in our environment. And if we can tag this as number one and we can meet this, then it just becomes next vulnerable. You know, as one comes out of the queue because you solve it, one goes into the queue to get solved. Um, what's more, don't incent based on sheer number of patch vulnerabilities or solved vulnerabilities or removed from the queue. We've seen organizations do that. And what that actually incented was the development of better false positive detection. So in other words, they figured out the fastest way to remove vulnerabilities from the queue was not to patch anything, but instead enumerate as many false positives as possible so that your stats would look better because you're removing hundreds of vulnerabilities from the queue instead of dozens. Um, so understand how you incent your patching and vulnerability management group to ensure that you're actually moving the needle in the best way possible. Because look, our employees are amazingly bright individuals and they do amazing things. And sometimes that can be gaming the system to make the stats look better. So we are running out of time. We only have a minute. I wanted to get to this last page and I'm going to... Um, Oops, sorry. Uh, I wanted to talk about our upcoming Redcon conference. So X-Force is having a, it's virtual second annual conference. It's research focused. Um, it's gonna be talking about new attack tools, incident response when things go sideways. Um, and it will have, oh, we're doing a talk on physical break-ins and actually showing demos of how we uh, unlock locked doors. Um, there's the link right there to register. We can send it around after the presentation as well. And you can see our web pages here too for both Exodus and IBM Security X Force. Uh, we thank you all for joining us today. If you have any questions that were not answered, feel free to email them to the HIMS admin that you work with, and we are happy to answer them that way. And thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.
All right, thank you. Thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you for the panel. I, I walked, I'm walking away with several aha moments and I'm sure all of you are as well. Um, just a, a reminder for our next month is Lunch and Learn is Nora Belcher. She's going to be giving us a legislative update. Uh, we have her here uh, every year in October. So um, we hope to have you join us then. Thanks again, everybody. <laughs>